And he suggests that Angel Velasco Shaw, who's with us today, uh, she's actually one of the jurors for this year's Atene Art Awards. Um, Angel has known yeah, Manuel for quite some time. Since 1991. Since 1991. So some of you may not have been born yet. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, um, we'll, we'll proceed with a discussion, with a conversation. Um, Angel has uh, asked some visuals no, to put um, Manuel's practice in the context of, of um, uh, art historical practices, no, uh, both locally and overseas and abroad. So we'll have Manuel and Angel. Thank you. Okay, but um, I wear many hats, and one of the major hats that I wear is as a teacher. So it gives me great pleasure to actually be in a room full of mostly students. So if I could just see some hands. Um, how many of you are, uh, hands not hacked. <laughs> actually, this is going to be a little bit of a talk show. <laughs> how many of you um, are interested in arts management? Hands? No arts management people? One. Two, okay, art history. So the rest of you, why are you here? <laughs> Is it a requirement? Okay, all right, so in the interest of our information design students. Ah, right, information design students, okay. So this is gonna be a conversation about translations. So what I mean by translations is not only in terms of who you are and what you aspire to do with your lives. Uh, try to forget that you've been required to come here. And let's put this in a whole other kind of context, which is the translations of an artist and the processes, the creative and intellectual process of an artist like Manuel Ocampo, who is not formally trained in the arts, or he's semi, he comes more from the school of life. And one could say that is what informs him uh, initially or intuitively. Um, so I just wanted to tell a little story about um, how I actually, my first encounter with Manuel, which was when I graduated from art school, um, in Los Angeles, I came back to the Philippines and uh, stayed here for five months. And within the first week of being here, I went to um, UP Fine Arts in 1985, and I saw Manuel's work. Um, and I was just blown away. And there was a comment book there, and I'd written in the comment book, whoever you are, you need to come to New York. And little did I know, he was in LA at that time. Um, fast forward, in 1991, uh, a Baguio artist named Roberto Villanueva, who is now deceased, um, was in Los Angeles and he met Manuel. And Robert came back to New York and he said, oh my God, you gotta meet this guy. You're gonna love him. Your work is, has a lot of not our work per se, but our ideas, because I'm a filmmaker. And our interests were paralleling. And so he really, really, really wanted me to, me to meet Manuel. So Manuel had come to New York in 1991, and I threw a party for him. And that was the beginning of our friendship. And over the years since then, I've had the opportunity to interact with him and have really great discussions. Um, he was also curated an exhibition that I did and will be in another exhibition in June 2017 um, at the Drawing Room. Um, and let's see. Well, that's all I can say about us meeting. <laughs> um, I, actually, I'd like to also try to say to everybody, can we try to keep this informal and we would like to invite you to, to engage with us. Actually, 
Manuel more so than me. I'm really here to facilitate. So Manuel's going to start with, um, I've asked him to bring some images of some of the artists from the Romantic period who influenced him um, in different ways. So Manuel's going to run through some images for you. set this up. Okay. Uh, to Goya? Go to Goya first. Yeah, uh, start with where, where is it? Or actually, you know what? No. Start, what? With, start with, um, start with your Spanish residency. Residency? Or we'll start with romanticism. No, no. How how do you define romanticism? I don't I don't know. What is what is it? The you, 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 of romanticism. You, you, yeah. From the late eighteen hundreds uh -huh. to the early nineteen hundreds, and then modernism. Uh huh. Why are they called uh, romantics? Are they like Martin. they go around with flowers and? <laughs> No, I just, I'm just curious, you know, why rom romanticism, why romantic? Because it has a different connotation right now. Okay. Roman okay. Romanticism. Okay. So what are the ideals of romanticism? Oh, sorry. Okay, so if you, if, this painting is called The Raft of Medusa by uh, Theodore de Charicol. Um Traditionally speaking, so it's just so everybody has a bit, because under, my understanding is that you've been studying Philippine art history and you haven't studied Western art history yet, or have you studied Western art history? Actually, I was just going to mention that that thing actually forms a triangle if you look at it closely. Yes, it does. Correct. I remember looking at this a long time ago. Uh -huh. Okay, and do you want to take a stab at what romanticism is, that movement of art? Yeah, it's uh, not exactly just a movement of art, it's actually a yeah, movement of like art, literature, drama, music, and vision by, you know, people like Lord Byron, who unfortunately died while trying to free the pieces from the Ottomans, not to mention right. writers. It's more from the Gothic literature, or drama, or satirical literature, which also came to survive this, but on the other hand, it focuses more on heroics, on drama, on you got it. That's right. I was actually going to say, wow, you're awesome. I was actually going to say awesome. that... Can, can, one, we, can oh. we bring him here? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you want to you wanna have a conversation with us? Right here? Huh? Kind over here. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was, can I add to your point? What's your name? Justin, actually. Justin. Justin. Hi, Justin. Okay, so... Justin's brought up a very, very, very important point that I think many people today also tend to forget. Movements of art are cultural movements that are inclusive of, let's say, the five arts, the traditional arts. So theater, visual, literature, dance, music, right? And Justin's absolutely correct that one, when one talks about also, if you do think, if you, as you move along in your studies, the Romantic period was a changing was a change in painting. Many of the painters during this, at this point, um, were shifting from being portrait painters for the matri uh, the monarchs. So, do people know what a monarchy is? Yes. It's a butterfly, right? <laughs> That's right, it's a butterfly. <laughs> okay, but to go back to Manuel's question in terms of romanticism, and I'm gonna have to speak in metaphors as well because what does it mean to you when you think of a, rom a romantic novel, why is it romantic? Hang on one second, Justin, let's ask your peers. Does anybody have? Romance, romantic, what does that mean? Come on, don't be shy. Yep. Could you stand up so we can hear you? Yeah. Romantic, basically, is idealized. Romantic. Keep going. I'm sorry. 
What do you mean that it's romantic? Uh, so like you know, the vision is uh, it's an idealized uh, vision of whatever yeah. society you're in. So yeah, for example, uh, class relations, so rich or poor, whatever your uh, whatever wherever whatever class you belong to, it's an idealized relationship. Like hey, you're good together, you can work something like that. Is that okay? Everything's okay. This is not about right or wrong. It's interpretation, right? So yes, and and if you think about certain romantic artists that Manuel, uh, one could say, was influenced by, and I'm going to let you take it from here in terms of representations of society, right? About what? About. About well, you know, R R Goya was a romantic painter. He is, is, he, is he really a romantic painter, or is, is he just within that period of romanticism? He is. Because I, I see him as a modern painter. OK, wait. Let's, OK, I agree with you. But since, this isn't, since the students here haven't studied um, Western history, let's, let's kind of veer away from talking about the periods of art and talk about what so looking at a painting like this or can we go to, is or any of his so this is not a I, I don't know if this is a romantic it's painting it's not it's not it is no? I, I agree with you that it's an early modern painting but yeah. can we go to uh, one his aquitants are they in there is that, is that a no keep, keep going keep going up down or uh, I, down yeah This one? No, wait. Huh? Where's Where's Goya? Is he in here somewhere? First time. There. Ah, okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So we go to work. Yeah. His His works. Mm -hmm. Manuel, let's talk about his. He's gonna have a home. Home of Okay. Let me. You wanna sit here? I'll sit down there. See, this we're not rehearsed. Okay, that's why we're trying to keep this casual. <laughs> okay. So if you look here, let's go to this one. Um, the sleep of yeah. Oh, um, well, may, maybe I should talk about my residency in France uh, before we get into Goya. Um, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, how do I take this off? Sorry. I, I want to go to the, I want to go to the, I, I want to go to uh, the, the desktop, in desk, the escritorio. And this one, the escritorio. Ah, that's not yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, escape, I think. Escape. <laughs> 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 not escape? Okay. No, escape. No, escape. You see how uh, savvy you are technically here, <laughs> huh? Not escape. <laughs> Command one? Yeah. It's okay if I eat. Is that for a Mac? Huh? Yeah. Here, there's a finder. Okay. Go to desktop. Sorry. <laughs> I see you have uh, your, your el el electric. <laughs> 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 how, you know, how do you, how do you, like that? <laughs> it's it's uh, Manuel Campo, Museo Goya. We look at you as a desktop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, put it in your desktop. Any particular folder? Is it in documents? Or it's it's a um, desktop. Okay. Well, desktop. While you're doing the desktop, wait, you go no, ahead, no, go no, ahead, no, go no, ahead, no. go ahead, go ahead. Have all have all of you seen the exhibition? Yes. How many people have not seen it yet? Okay. Um, when you saw the exhibition, and if people can just speak, um, you know, as openly as you feel comfortable with. What were you getting from that exhibition? Do any of you speak Spanish or understand Spanish? OK. Um, just, to, just, to, just to give you all a little bit so you don't feel so shy about speaking, um, Manuel's pretty used to criticism. So. Um, 
uh, you know, I, I think what would be really helpful is if we could hear your perspectives on, on the work itself. Okay, so while they're trying to figure out how to, yeah, okay. Um, if we could just hear some points of view of what your interpretations are of the exhibition. Is that possible? Yeah. Could you stand up so we can hear you? Thank you. And can you, sorry, because um, when you say angry and overwhelming, what do you mean by that? Um, perhaps it's because it's different from what we usually, um, we usually see in art galleries when it's a clean wall and you focus on the work. There you see um, streets of paint outside the wall and it's um, very hard to reconcile with what we're used to. So the way I'm hearing it, though, is not qualifying anger and overwhelming as something negative. No, 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 no. That's, that's great. That It's important to be able to talk about work. I mean, you know, Manuel is a, he may have been born and raised in the Philippines, but he's a really cosmopolitan or um, global, sorry for the labels, he hates being categorized and labeled, but for the benefit of all of you, just so that you feel more comfortable and at ease. I don't think that he or myself or, or the organizers and the curators at Ateneo Art Gallery think that young people should necessarily know how to quote unquote read art or experience art. That is also the beauty of art and what I would call good art is that a viewer comes back, whether you're confused or overwhelmed, um, one would hope that the artist is asking or luring their audiences to come back and look again, right? So that's why I also asked you if you could clarify a little bit more, because I think it's good to at least be able to name your experience, OK? All right, is there anybody else? J Justin. Okay. Uh, he hasn't seen it. Oh, you haven't seen it? You, you want to go? <laughs> like, we'll give you yeah, five minutes. Go ahead, yeah. uh, Justin, you can go. That's good. Yeah. Well, well, when they say when they say that uh, when an artist um, creates work, it's really about trauma. It's about uh, recovering something traumatic and trying to overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, uh, in some sense, it's like recovering that trauma, and sort of like taking over it. I don't know if that's a Freudian analysis of why artists make art, I think. Well, <clears throat> let's, let's, let's get a little bit more specific, though, in terms of your own work. Let's go back to Manuel Ocampo as much as you hate going there. OK, so can we get this thing to go back on? Oh. 
<laughs> okay, so we we're not millennials, right? We're we're over that. Um, no, it's okay. So Manuel, would you like to talk about this? Yes. Uh, so um, there's a museum in France uh, called Musée Goya. It's in um, it's a, it's, a, it's in a small provincial town called called Castres. And they have, because you know, Goya died in, in France, in Bordeaux. And so they were able to acquire this painting. Um, and th this painting is titled um, La Junta de Filipinas. And it's about, it's about the, um, these shareholders who are part of La Junta de Filipinas. It's like an East, in. It's like similar to East India trading company with the British, but with the Spanish, it's La Junta de Filipinas. And these are shareholders who uh, have stocks in the country called the Philippines. And it's a meeting. They commissioned Goya to, uh, uh, to document the meeting with the, the king. Uh, yeah, okay. I was going to say Philip. <laughs> okay. Yeah, King, King Ferdinand III. And he's, he's one of the... Let me just interject for a second. Everybody here is aware that we've been, we were colonized by Spain for 377 years, right? Are we on the same page? Okay. So, so just as a historical reference, Goya was commissioned to make this painting because um, the Peninsula Wars, which um, Napoleon, who was French, he invaded Spain, and this war affected Goya tremendously. One of the paintings that you saw earlier, where Manuel said that's really a modernist painting, it's not a romantic painting. Um, that painting is one of Goya's uh, ex uh, responses to the war. So it was a little bit ironic in some ways that he was then commissioned to make this painting, um, which I believe is on the heels of that war. Right. OK, so. Uh, how do you enlarge this? Do you want to? Yeah. OK, so um, the mu museum, the Goya Museum in France owned this piece. And um, this was done in 18, 1815. To celebrate the 200 year anniversary of this piece, they invited me to do a residency and um, do a sort of an intervention or a dialogue with the piece. And I'll, I'll uh, right now I'll show you uh, what I did. So this is a digital print of the of that painting, but I uh, I painted a like a flood scene over it, sort of like the 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 shareholders are sort of. <laughs> trying to, uh, you know, like uh, pull their heads up in order to breathe in the flood scene. Because also, I'm trying to connect uh, Spain and the Philippines with the idea of it being surrounded by water, like the Philippines. And also, you know, referencing uh, the floodings here. And um, in some sense, it uh, talks about metaphorically how, because uh, during that time, uh, Spain was in over its head with, uh, with a crisis 
uh, financial crisis with the wars going on, with the Napoleonic Wars. And so it's sort of like a metaphor at that time, but which connects within the present time also. Because right now Spain is also in crisis. Um, Which is also why, um, you know, at that time, there were only three or four colonies of the Spanish colonies left, and the Philippines was one of was, them. Was one of the last. Was yeah, actually. was one of the last. And S Spanish rule in the Philippines was already on its decline which m much of Manuel's work, and he'll show you more of his works, also address that time period. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, just a historical one. The, 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 uh, you said the painting of the execution of the insurrectionists was painted right? The Goyo's painting of the execution of the insurrectionists right. was painted right before these? Um, when was that? Um, and those insurrectors were insurrectors of what? They were, were they, they were? No, uh, wait, wait a minute. Um, where was that? Where is that? Um, you showed it earlier. Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de, no, Tres de Mayo. Tres de Mayo. Uh, the, yeah, that one there. Yeah. No, these are, uh, the, these are uh, French soldiers. Massac massacring the Spanish insurgents because at that time uh, uh, Spain was colonized by France. Okay. Okay. So they're insurgents. Yeah, insurgents. Insurgents. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this was produced in 1814, just a year before Goya did. Uh, okay. so far as to talk about the relationship between the Filipinos revolting against Spain. And, you know, a lot of Manuel's work, again, addresses the Philippine-Spanish um, history and colonial legacy. Um, well, you can actually see it right here with this big hand sort of squashing the king. <laughs> the, the, yeah. Or, okay. It, go on. Well, I mean, these are sort of like, I mean, I'm play, uh, I'm sort of playfully um, playing around with this great big painting. It's one of Goya's largest paintings, and um, the, as you can see in the, in the exhibition space, it's just small print, and it's a way for me to like play around with the painting and um, do something silly in some sense. Like like with this one, like a hand. You know, we, we all do that in some ways, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's something very trivial. Huh? Do you know what that is when you minimize? That's to minimize something, or you're, right? It's like... Or you're squishing the yeah, hands. you're squishing you know? them, right? <laughs> But I'm going to, I know, I'm hoping I'm not going over your heads here, but if you, again, because if you look at the exhibition and how Manuel talks about painting is like a slow read. So that goes back to being able to enter into a piece of work, into a piece of artwork, like the way you read literature or the way you read a poem or the way you watch a play or listen to music. You have to really go into that zone. And if you... Look, well, this painting too. When he talks about scale, Goya himself is making a comment. Remember, he was a court painter. And when he broke out of being a court painter, the way Manuel Ocampo breaks out of tradition, and he's kind of known in many ways internationally as a bad boy, um, which he can talk about whether he wants to or not. But if you read the symbolism, in Manuel's work and the influences of Goya on Manuel, you can understand a little bit about the relationship of power and power structures, which is what the quote-unquote romantic painters were trying to address 
as Manuel's work also addresses. Am I right? That's right. <laughs> well, anyway, this this uh, piece right here, it's, uh, you know, since the meeting, you know, the original painting, the, the, the people in the painting look bored and um, so formal. You know, you see some of them sleeping, some of them texting, you know, and uh, I don't know. And so <laughs> I decided to liven up the, the atmosphere and put a disco ball and spotlights. But that's the globe. That's a globe, but globe, disco ball, in, in a sense. So it's talking about like globalization, but at the same time talking about something like really inane, like a disco party. <laughs> Um, it's um, no. The exhibit was called uh, Goya, as seen by Ocampo. And in fact, they they had a misprint, and it it was sort of reversed, like Ocampo, as seen by Goya. <laughs> <laughs> How, how do I get out of here? Do you have more? Or? Yeah, I have more. Okay. okay. And, and here's a piece. Um, since it's about uh, a meeting about the, the, the stocks in the Philippines, I uh, sort of put a native um, chieftain or something like that, like waiting for them. You know, there's, there's, this is sort of a very a narrative in, in, in this uh, painting. The noble savage. Huh? The noble savage. But at the same time, I don't know if it's, there's that ambiguity within the, the, the image because it's a novel, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a noble savage, but at the same time, it's on a pedestal. You don't know if it's in, in a museum, or, or what, you know? Do you want to talk a little bit t so that they can understand a little bit about um, your use of symbols, metaphors, and um, uh, ironic humor? Oh, Justin, he's going to respond. Yeah. I saw something there that incorporated portions of the Picasso painting, the bomb and the flag that got into the... Right. Wow. Yeah, there was a... It sits next to this. Wow, yeah. He's Yeah. Where is that? <laughs> I didn't even know where it was. Oh, I think it's the next one. There. There. Yeah, this one. Actually, yeah. The, this one is... It's a more pointed critique of the painting um, because um, I don't know if if people are familiar with the Guernica. Maybe you can explain the, the Guernica, huh? 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 Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, you want me to explain? Yeah. I mean, Picasso painted the Guernica as a reaction to uh, the. The, the 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 bombing the the Nazi bo bombing which Franco the dictator allowed the 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 Germans to fly above uh, the Basque uh, the Basque country uh, which is a, a small town called Guernica and uh, this was uh, Picasso's reaction. To, uh, to that bombing. He painted this huge painting that was, um, that was exhibited at the World's, World's Fair in, uh, was it in New York? 1964, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, as a protest against um, the fascist regime 
of, uh, of Franco. And so I, I, I put it in this painting, sort of connecting um, the colonizers um, with that of uh, the fascist regime of Franco. But it's also, <clears throat> I mean, very expressive. I mean, I want to try to go back to this train of thought and how Man Manuel's work is um, what I interpret as being very connective and part of a continuum of um, not, he's not just intervening in um, an artist's work who um, he holds in respect. He's also creating another work which is part of his own process. Um, can, maybe, is there a way for you to flip through these while we're talking? And I did flip, flip and, through these. Oh, you'd have to put them into um, preview? I'll, I'll open on. 3D? Pre no, no. Preview, uh, preview. I'll open on. And as Justin pointed out, I mean, so he's basically, um, he's also creating a dialogue with history and very specific moments in history whether it's social, cultural, political, okay. right? Yeah. C can, can people f follow that, what I'm saying? <laughs> no. No? No? <laughs> yep, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hmm? The arrow, okay. This arrow? No. no, no okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So these these are the works that I uh, I painted during my residency in in France. Can, can I? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. If you look at the image of the man, the style of this paint of of this style here is very Goya esque, right? This has references to primitivism. I'm, right. I'm going back to the interlinking of art, historic movements, and life itself, the history of the world, so to speak. This is a motif that Manuel uses in many of his paintings for how many decades? I mean, the yeah. vulture, buzzer. Yeah, yeah, the vulture, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the vulture is sort of like a recurring motif in my, in my work. Um, it's as an artist, it's a creature I, I sort of identify with, because um, as an artist, you sort of like um, I see history as a carcass <laughs> in some ways, and you feed off of that, and um, you sort of um, process it. Um, you uh, regurgitate it. You you um, you sort of um, in some ways appropriate it, and and what you shit out, it's that's the artwork. <laughs> Which is another motif in his work, feces. <laughs> uh, min minima moralia is um, it's it's an it's a writing by Theodore Adorno. He's uh, he's a uh, He's a theorist from the Frankfurt School, and um, Minimum Moralia is uh, his sort of like, um, how, how would you say that? It's, he wrote it during his exile in California, in Los Angeles, and he's sort of like uh, thinking back at, uh, at uh, huh? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know what, what go ahead. I don't know how to explain it. You see, <laughs> so he he's, he was sort of like reflecting upon the the life he's lived and the, the writings, um, and so yeah, that's 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 what. Uh, um, minimum. minimum of morality, yeah, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Sausages, so some of the motifs of, of Manuel 
are actually all embodied in this paint. Not all, he has others, but sausages, feces, buzzards or vultures, um, I, religious, Catholic iconography, uh, references to primi primitivism again. Um, you want to keep flipping so that you. I think I think the reference to primitivism is sort of like a reference to co to colonialism in some sense, and how it sort of um, paved the road into modernism mm -hmm. because uh, it's the the, ex the the colonial exchange within the West and the non-Western uh, non-Western world. This one is called the mockery, a mockery of the sacred, and uh, it's uh, a, f a figure from a Goya print. And I'm just playing around with the particulars, with the elements that's in the print. Um, yeah. So this one is called "Se defiende bien." He uh, defends himself well. And um, in, in Goya's paintings, in Goya's prints, the, the monkey symbolizes the, the artist, sort of, sort of like in an ironic way, because the artist is sort of like trying to copy nature, meaning trying to ape nature, in a sense. And so the monkey represents the artist. And the unicorn represents the ideal. And se defiende bien is the, the unicorn <laughs> defending himself from all these um, um, sort of artists trying to portray the ideal. Can you talk about your, the motif of the, of the cross or the crucifix in many of your paintings? I use the cross a lot in my paintings because I see it. Um, I mean, it, it refers to my to my growing up here, where you see the cross a lot, and it's something that um, I see it's something as some as pop, you know, like how uh, Warhol would see the Saint Campbell soup cans as uh, in, um, reflective of, a cult of his culture. And I see the cross as reflective of my culture. Is it just a reflection, or are you also somehow well, there's a lot of There's a lot of critique, of yeah. course. There's only some ambiguity uh, with my sentiments regarding uh, Catholicism and uh, the imagery because, yeah. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, it could be. Uh, because Catholicism, is, it's sort of like the, um, we live in this culture, in this Catholic culture, it's sort of like um, opened the doors for me, you know in like looking at all these paintings that are based on on um, on on the, the on Jesus on the cross on the Madonna on uh, I mean in a sense it's sort of like uh, the basis of Western art um, and so my relationship with it is sort of like it's a love and hate relationship and it's something I sort of cannot, you know, separate myself from. Um, so that's why there's a lot of crosses. There's a lot of references to Catholicism in my work. Um, Which I also think is interesting. It, it, it just dawned on me too, again, in terms of how history is connecting um, from, especially European, if you think about, again, going back to who were the painters painting for? They were painting, their portraits were of the monarchs, the noble, 
uh, what do you call them? The noble, e the, the noble class, nobility, clergy, right? So again, if you think about, um, or I I'll ask you, so in some ways, are these also responses to Western art history yes. as, as, a, as a form of power? Yes, yes, I think so, yeah. Because it, in some ways it, it's Western art history who, dicta who, who uh, dictated how we look at things, how we look at images, how we look at uh, visuals. Uh, I mean, up until now, you know, with video, with, um, uh, with the movies we see, it's always, it's always been informed by that history of, um, of West, Western, Western painting and Western art history. And it's already there that set out that, you know, with romanticism as, as the ideal. Yeah, and um, for me, my work is sort of like a reaction to that. Um, whether it's criticizing, whether it's uh, playing around with it, or um, you know, what, playing around with the postulates, or uh, just presenting it as something that uh, that's, that I am sort of engulfed in, um, sort of um, yeah. So that's how I. I my connection is with um, this whole uh, 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 Western art history or c Christian, c Catholic art history. By reverence, by wor worship, or or something, I, I, I see I see as an artist. I see myself as someone who is, uh, I would say, close to being a monk. <laughs> because because I I, I no because. He's Why actually you, correct, but you have to really think about be, be, monks. Be, because <laughs> no, because uh, I, I paint every day, and I see painting as a, a sort of like a ritualized, a ritualized practice, which is sort of like a prayer, in some sense. You know, sort of my God is art. You know, and not a monotheistic being. Um, and yeah, so it's sort of a, like a, 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 there's a certain reverence, you know, within that practice. Irreverence. Irreverence? Yeah. I mean, that also goes hand in hand, you know, with the, you know, that's the, 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 the flip side of it, which um, I, I, I think in some sense, um, if, if you really think about it, monk, monks or religious people really question themselves very much. And I think as an artist, I do too. I question myself. I question my practice. And um, so there's that, that uh, co uh, contradiction within, you know, one being. Apart from uh, some, uh, something wild that's being trained to become more straight, what? Yeah, it's self acting, self explanatory. Um, Angel, there's a question. Somewhat? More recent images have been critiqued. My critique of the art. Where is that? I don't know. Yeah. 
commentary or criticism versus merely just like self-reflection? What, what, what do you mean? I, I, I don't have any images of which stuff. Oh, Goya. Yeah. Ah, well, that's, that's connected to Goya. Uh, oh, yeah. so specifically for Goya. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think I think the witchcraft imagery in Goya is, is sort of like, um, I think in a way, um, uh, he's, he's, em he's embracing that rather than critiquing it. You know, it's sort of like something that's sort of anti-hierarchical, uh, anti -hier sort of. Like, because with, with, the, with, the pagan, with the pagan tradition, and Goya is very steeped in that, in that tradition. He, uh, Goya himself was really um, questioning and critiquing the contradictions of uh, Catholicism. Again, he, he was very engaged in um, critiquing his own contradictions, right? I have to keep going back to the fact that he was a court painter. So he was commissioned. He wasn't allowed to paint what he wanted to paint. He was being commissioned to paint what other people wanted him to paint, which can be quite stifling for, for any creative person, right? And Goya was also going deaf. He eventually went deaf. Um, there are questions as to whether or not he quote unquote went mad, all these kinds of things. and. Um, also during the Romantic period, and you can see this within poetry as well, um, it's not just um, witchcraft or it's cults, it's mm -hmm. um, um, a fascination and a practice as and well um, during that time period. During that time there was a counter-reformation as well. Yeah. And, and all of these artists were trying to break, all of the artists, I mean mus everybody, poets, musicians, novelists, painters trying to break out of something that was prescribed upon them in much the same way that uh, an artist like Manuel um, was trying to do. I mean, he left the Philippines for reasons, went to the United States, went to Spain, went to Rome, went back to the Philippines, went back to Europe. And, I mean, which I think, if I look at this as an outsider to his work, I would say he's also still questioning the, these places of power and powerlessness. Um, so I asked Manuel if he could actually show some of his more recent works uh, when he was really outwardly critiquing the art world, the oh. international art world. And you know, if he could talk about that phase in his work. What, critiquing, critiquing the art world? <laughs> oh, here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> where is that? I don't know where it is. <laughs> Go back to my mom and Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, view image, actually. Yeah, view image. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is this critiquing the art world? I don't know. Maybe. It's critiquing the art, which one can interpret in that way, yes. Oh, uh, Justin wanted to. It, I could say in a way, from my perspective, it looked like it's critiquing the levels of religious indoctrination we receive in this country because I came from Japanese grade school and the level of indoctrination there was something not quite right. Uh -huh. Like, for example, they, no offense to anyone from the grade school, but the processions, the religious masses that we held in the covered courts, I guess, it, not to mention the fact that we had to memorize the same kinds of prayer, the same kinds of. Uh, right. Biblical verses, the same kinds of pieces of scripture for sealing classes that greatly resembles the kind of numbness that you get to it, and you don't really learn anything. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, 
it's uh, this sort of indoctrination is sort of like uh, creating sheep yes. to to um, um, sheep to sort of like herd and to slaughter. Yes. That's why the Christian symbol of the sheep, the the, the, the Catholic symbolizes the sheep as a, as the sacrificial lamb and while uh, witchcraft or or, or paganist uh, religion um, they sort of try to put the goat as their symbol you know the the horned goat because the the horned goat is someone who is strong who is like independent and uh, yeah who's who's uh, sort of likes, just likes to fuck everyone, you know? While the sheep is like, you know, they're, they're the ones who gets fucked, you know? Yeah, I've also noticed that your imagery also invokes swastikas and Jewish stars of David. Like, I saw some of the pictures there, and they really remind me of the sort of racial purity propaganda that Goebbels and, what is the name of the editor of Sturmer again? I forget, but they look like the sort of propaganda that the Nazis propagated as part of their racial purity campaigns in the 30s and 40s. And a lot of them really resemble that are used to swastika as imagery. In fact, they don't really have a tattoo that looks like one of those uh, nose art that you see on British Twitter or the people the lions can that the swastika. Right. Yeah. yeah well, th these are these are things that sort of like the swastika and the, the and you know the just are, they're, they're, they're they symbolically sort of like created that rupture, you know, within modern art, and uh, that's why uh, the, these symbols are important for me to put in my my paintings because they represent that sort of rupture. Yeah, I think it's, it's part of that history also. Right, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's this part. The Antarcticus, yeah. Antarcticus. So are you, in, by using these kinds of um, really, uh, you know, it's not just that they're universal images or icons, right. um, they're loaded, so to speak, right? So, could you talk about the, the deliberacy of using the juxtapositions of these kinds of, of icons? Um, you, you mean if I... No, can you, well, can you just talk about... Well, no, no, I, I, you, yeah. I, I, you know, I put this high icons out there in, a, in my painting or in my work. Um, Sort of to see, it's sort of like an experiment to see what happens, to see how they they uh, they clash with each other. Um, I'm not going after a certain reading or a certain meaning. I'm uh, I'm going uh, after like the, the 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 sort of the postulates, you know, the, the elements that that are out there already in the world. And um, see how they, they they connect with each other, and see how they they speak with each other. Um, in some sense, I, I use it as a as a decoration, as an ornament. Um, in a, in some sense, I use it as sort of like to uh, uh, cr critique um, the the symbol or. Uh, sort of like uh, put it within a certain context mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, speaking to the audience. But um, there's, there's really no uh, one, one, one thing mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm going after. So it's know? very um, ambiguous then? Yeah, it's open, or, or, it's open or, yeah, for interpretation. Ambiguous and intertextual. Right. Right. Could, could you talk a little bit about the responses um, 
to your works and the differences between, over the years, the differences between the responses to your works in the US, in Europe, and in the Philippines? Wow. OK. I, that's, <laughs> I that's a lot. That's a, um, I think in US, uh, I, I started out with the advent of uh, multiculturalism. And so they, they saw it as a critique of colonialism. Um, and in Europe, I'm, I'm sort of seen as sort of like continuing this tradition of painting, of uh, high, um, sort of highly loaded painting, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, the manner of like either Kiefer. Um, and the Philippines, I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. <laughs> so, Do you think you need to explain your work here? Uh, in, in what sense? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, Maybe again, I, because you're okay. I I brought this image up on purpose because one of the things that attracts me to the kind of work that Manuel's doing today is. One might say he's appropriating himself. He's moving his own creative practice forward, taking work that he's reconfiguring it. And he's revisiting something that he had done in another form. Right. And in some ways saying that painting is a continuum. And one of the things that happens is that when you make objects, People consider it to be, well, that's it. It's an object, you own it, it's done, it's on a wall. So don't reference that work again. That's one point of view. And Well, I think that's, that's a, a neoliberal capitalist uh, idea of obsolescence. OK, it's been done before. Let's get on to the next thing so we can sell it in a so, okay, so, new. so then is this work a response to that neoliberal? Neo, well, neoliberal? no, no, it's, it's really, um, uh, it's sort of like, in a way, trying to rethink my past works. Right. I'm sorry, are they negatives? The, past works? Are they these, these are actually silk screen, uh, these are silk screens that are, uh, which, uh, they are the negatives, negatives of my work from the 90s. Yeah. And then just going back to the topic of religious or ideological symbolism, the first picture, the other picture that you drew up with the, the, the cross of the, the yes sir, no sir. Yeah. Uh, I never understood that painting, so I had a long time. Ago. Yes sir, what no sir. I, I think that's within the Philippine context. You know how people like say yes sir, no sir. Yeah, but then there, in the image, there is a cross, which is a German, uh, a Nazi symbol. Uh, no, I don't think that's a Nazi symbol. You know, it's just a cross. It's 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 a cross, but it's sort of like an aestheticized cross. But you know, I'm, when I put the swastika there, I'm not really referring to like really Nazis or. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's not. It's a, not a swastika. Right? Underneath, you reference uh, some orders. That's a it's a Picasso because he's the sir of uh, painting in a sense, but I'm I'm sort of like there's a a lot of layers into 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 that painting and you can I don't know you can already guess who or what I'm referring to, no yeah okay, well <laughs> so maybe we can we can talk about it privately. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I was thinking about the quote of uh, one of your quotes and then you and then you decided to put one of your paintings on top of it. Right. Or uh, was there something to it? Or was there a deeper meaning to it? Um, and was it just for the elevator? I, I think with 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 the the way we see texts and images, they sort of like um um 
they, they sort of short circuit each other out, you know. When 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 there's an image on top of it, uh, on top of text, it's saying okay, it's it's calling more attention into what it's covering, you know. So I'm I'm sort of like playing with this thing with how we look at things, you know. That's why if, if yeah, per, perspective. We, we, if if we erase something, we try to find out what is underneath that more more than if we like put it out there in the open. So I'm playing a game in some sense. It's also kind of letting the viewers experience uh, that it's a bit more rather than just relying on. That's right. Yeah. But this is what I mean by um, again like. There are many different kinds of artists, right? So if there are artists where I often feel that if people, um, I was a security guard at the Museum of Modern Art, and so I spent eight hours a day, five days a week, watching people look at art, and most of them were just, you know, in their, if bubbles could pop up, the bubbles were saying, what am I looking at? Why is this art? Why is this in this museum? You know, whatever, things like that. Is this artist crazy? You know, whatever. Um, but in some of my observations of viewers, you also realize that there are the viewers who will stay and defy their own sense of logic or fear. A lot of times with, with modern art and contemporary art, people run away in fear because they're like, I don't get it. Rather than spending time with the work, or like, do you read poetry? Not that much. Okay, so did when or some poetry that you've read? Do you ever go? I don't know what I just read. Okay, do, does that ever happen? Yeah. Okay, so which is normal, by the way. Okay, so if you if you think about this earlier, I said this discussion is about translations. It's a conversation, and it's the way that an artist like Manuel is translating periods of art histories, his own history, all of these different kinds of things. And what does it mean when you try to share that with an anonymous viewer? And you come from another part of the world, or you come from the same culture, but you- They get lost you, in translation. Yes, you get lost in translation. And if, is this the original, Manuel? Or no, this that's is another? Uh, screen. So I couldn't find the original painting. That's what I, I was trying oh. to find. So to go back to this process of what he and I have been talking about this for a little while in terms of what does it mean for an artist in this day and age to take work, your own work, and connect certain images or certain, like in his case, he has certain, yeah, very specific images that reoccur. And it, it's very connective. And then what happens when that's like a very private kind of act, but it goes public? And, you know, in the car right over here, we were talking about how it, it makes it difficult for the artist because what happens is, is you're seeing an exhibition of work and people want to see something that might be considered new. So what is the difference between regurgitation do you know what I mean by regurgitation? Or work that doesn't seem original or fresh evolution of an artist to a continuation of work and ideas and critiquing yourself. Are you following me or have I lost you? I understand. Oh, good, great. Okay, so, but I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at the original of this. Yeah. art here because it's really based on like the market and that's sort of like um, it's sort of frustrating for me because there's there really is no infrastructure 
created other than the market, other than like the auction houses, the galleries, and um, yeah, it's 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 just that. No? I, I think just to put it, can you put it in a larger context of? Um, because there's a whole history of the gallery, of the museum, right? Um, so maybe if you could ex share a little bit more of your experiences as an artist who's shown in numerous galleries, museums, and whatnot, uh -huh. to, so that he, you can put it in a bigger context. Could, so that, um, because the Philippines is, is um, it's it's new it's to new. the it's, it's new it's, to it's new the, to to to, the to this right. thing called contemporary art. Um, I mean, when I when I participate abroad, um, it's uh, there's a whole thing, um, um, sort of the, there's there, there's a whole thing that's uh, that's the, that's being created. It's not just the gallery system. There's also like uh, the the institutions, uh, and also there there are um, sort of the press, the publications, um, and uh, pr print print printing print media. Um, um, there's the, the I'm involved with universities with certain cultural associations. Um, but here, in, in, in some ways, to operate as an artist, you need to be part of the market, you know? Which is, for an artist, which is very limiting. And also, like, um, I wouldn't be able to, to come to the States or to come to, to Rome or to, to come to Spain without um, without foundations or institutions giving grants to artists, and that's that's one thing that's that's lacking here. Um, so I don't know to 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 answer your question again. It's you know, huh? Well, well, the Philippines is in a process. I mean, if it's, it's, it's as a country, if it's young, right? As a nation. And then if, if, when Manuel talks about an infrastructure, I think one has to think about many forms of infrastructures. I mean, if the government itself does not support culture and the arts, in the educational system, and then in terms of granting um, artists and all these kinds of things, it becomes, it becomes like a vicious um, cycle, and it becomes a very difficult thing to do. Right, um, to be able to uh, get people involved. I mean, the whole, most of the audience has, has gone. Granted, they're students, and maybe they have to go to another class, which is understandable. We're just but, boring. But yeah, we're boring. Uh, but but this but just to be as a metaphor, what does that mean if you can't sustain an audience? If, if there's no way for someone to understand languages of contemporary art. I, I think it's it's we gotta also, do something. I think it's also uh, like in other countries, it's a way it's a way for them to give importance to culture. Like for the people like for example in, 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 in Spain where I live, like culture is something that's very important. It's like you see little kids coming to museums, you see it in, in papers, it's just not in the lifestyle section of the papers. It's sort of like arts and culture, and um, it's something that you see you see on their stamps. It's something that you see uh, uh, in their streets, like artist's name. It, but but here, it, it I, I don't know. We're we're still in that process of like sort of creating something out of culture and I don't know, maybe maybe thinking that it's something more important than just making money or the market, that it's about um, nation building and it's about uh, us uh, being Filipino or uh, 
because because I, I think here the culture is just something that's sort of like seen as I mean like in the lifestyle section it's like only for the like elite for the one percent who can enjoy but the rest okay you don't have access to that you, you don't understand it then don't don't go there and and that's that's I think that's that's a problem but I think we're still in that infancy stage. Uh -huh. Okay, sorry. But how do you see it, like, the same with other countries? So do you see the Philippines as a country that's like practicing contemporary art in the future, like the other countries practicing today? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think it'd be much more, I think the Philippines, the exciting thing about the Philippines to me, or let's say Manila because the contemporary art scene in the rest of the archipelago is really unknown. Um, it's really Manila. It's very Manila-centric. So, um, and there's a lot of talent all over the archipelago. Um, but in terms of uh, what I see in Manila, and Manuel, I'd love to know if this is one of the reasons also why you came back and still and formed your collectives here, is that there's an extraordinary amount of talent. It's raw, but I don't, I hope, I really hope that Filipino artists do not try to emulate the West, that they create something in their own image, if that's possible for a country that's now colonizing itself. Right, something that people don't want to talk about, but the country is colonizing itself. And it's part of the phenomenon which you can turn around from a negative into a positive, right? Which is so exciting. And that's what I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting yeah. to see. Yeah, you, you see the, the, the possibilities are totally open. It's like you can do anything, really. And um, you, you can be the first to do it. You can, you know, you can pave uh, ways, you know, paths into doing um, what you want to do. So as a, as a creative individual, um, Manila is sort of, or the Philippines is sort of like a treasure trove, you know. Like a treasure trove. You know, like, yeah, uh, somebody wanted to No, he, she's. You started by saying, by, by, by telling us how you got to know of that. So I was just wondering, when you were, when you saw his work in UP, what was it about it that got to you, that made you write that comment that at that point in time, based on what you had been exposed to and then seeing that? And then for Manuel, I was just wondering about. Um, like exercises like these that ask the artist to sort of explain and talk about the works that they've done. I'm, I'm just wondering how, when you're confronted with your own works, um, how much of what went into it and was apparent to you when you were making it? I mean, how much of it was conscious and strategic maybe on your part? And then, how is there a part of the work that is sort of revealed to you also once you're confronted with it in places, in, in situations like this? So I'm just wondering how that feeds into your... Uh, okay, so who we'll gets the answer first? You too. Uh, I get the answer. Sure. Well, you're talking about my, my process, you know. Um, it's it's very instinctual, like like most, I think most painters um, uh, sort of um, um, their, their process is very instinctual. It's something that that uh, that in interests them, but they cannot explain. You know, it's it's something that's uh, 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 taken by by gut feel. Um, and then, and then you start to rationalize it. Sometimes you can't even rationalize it um, because, for for me, the process is um, there's a, a lot of simultaneous uh, um, st 
stimuli that's that's going on you know as as a painter you have to deal with color you have to deal with form you have to deal what it means and uh you you have to deal uh like really trivial stuff with size with how it's hung and all, all you're 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 confronted with this barrage of 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 questions and you, you start to uh, problem solve, and um, sometimes, sometimes the the uh, how you um, how you solve the form is successful, but how you deal with what it means is is uh, is you cannot articulate it, you know. So in a sense, uh, uh, painting is. Uh, is a simultaneous information that that is about what what you are thinking, but then it goes beyond what you are thinking. You no, know? I, I I I don't <laughs> I I don't know. So, in a sense, you're sort of like I, I feel as a painter, you're just a vessel. You're just a medium. You know, and you lay you 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 are guided by 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 ghosts. You know, I, I I did an exhibition once where the title is called "Guided by Sausage," <laughs> because it's it's from this band called Guided by Voices, because it's already been, you know, there's already guided by voices. Why not guided guided by sausage sausage? <laughs> Because you're you're always thinking of certain nonsensical things. I mean, for me, it's it's always. I mean, coming from a punk aesthetic, mm -hmm. you know, like a do-it-yourself punk aesthetic. It's like you you sort of like not 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 care about. No, you can laugh at yourself even when you're being serious. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to answer your question, um, well, because at that time, and again, I came out of a, a very, an art school that continues to be um, seen as, if not the number one art school in the world, it certainly is within the top three. <laughs> and, well, it's a number uh, one art school, actually. Is it still? During the 80s. Oh, for sure. And California Institute of the Arts, or Cal Arts. And, um, when I went to that school, when I first, it's a conceptual art school. Um, and I grew up in New York, and I was a very precocious kid, and went out to LA not knowing anything about the school. I thought I was going to be a painter. And I entered the school as a painter. And I left the school, thanks to my conceptual art mentors, as what's called a post-studio artist. Who are these art mentors? Uh, John Boldasari, um, Michael Asher, Douglas Hubler, Jeremy Gilbert Rolf. I mean, they're. So these are really big time artists. These are big, big time artist teachers. Yes, and a lot of great visiting artists. And in some ways, they were terrifying because um, I was very New York and I kind of had my own attitude. And, but they somehow beat painting out of me. And so I think I stifled myself. And I, when I, so when I went to the Philippines, and I saw Manuel's work, and also at that time there was only one other Filipino um, whose poetry I was aware of, a woman named Jessica Hagedorn, um, who also influenced me tremendously and has become a very dear friend. And when I saw Manuel's work, I just, you know, I, I, I said to him earlier, I said, I hope it doesn't sound corny, but he's a kindred spirit in more ways than one. I mean, not just through his painting and the fact that he, he can paint in so many different styles and he can trust that and he can play with it and he can play with an audience, um, but his topics, the themes and the topics that he chooses to um, depict in his work. And also because, um, well, I didn't know this until later, but his work with 
different kinds of communities, forming collectives, right? But at that time in 1985, it was this immediate connection of, oh, I'm not alone and all this stuff. And I was so bummed out that he was actually in LA. <laughs> and I had just left, you know, I just fled LA because I hated it. And, and there he was in LA. Right? Of course you're in New, New York. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, would, you would have hate LA. <laughs> I was born in LA, though. That's how I got oh, my name. Oh, yeah. ah, okay. But yeah, so that's so that's that's how you know. And and there is something to be said, actually, of um, um, and we people have written about our work in one like critical essay and stuff, which uh, you know I was always f flattered and and at the same time going, wow, this is interesting. Because again, I'm in film, and and he's a painter. Um, but I think because we deal with very similar um, topics, people will analyze. And again, these are, uh, you know, writers from abroad, critics from abroad, not in the Philippines. And we've also been criticized in similar ways, um, and uh, which is comforting, um, at least for me. <laughs> I mean, if I can share this story about when yeah, I moved I, I here three years this, uh, ago, can I can I tell that? Sure, story? yeah. Okay, so when I moved here three years ago, <laughs> Manuel said, "Oh, I'm so glad because now they can people can hate somebody else." <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, <laughs> that's you know." <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of passing the baton to right. you, <laughs> but. That's not, it's not about hate, it is about, we're schooled, and now I'm talking about the school of life, not the school of art school, but the school of life, in so many different ways. And where you're born, what class you're from, what region you're from, all these things impact and influence who you are. And then if you're on top of all this, an artist, and you have this like insane desire, or it's not even desire, but it's like an obsession, or driven, or you know, the demons come and haunt you, and you just, you have to make things, right? You just have to make things, whether you sell them or not, because it's on that kind of level. And actually, believe it or not, when, when I first saw his work, again, I was very comforted I didn't know him then, but that it wasn't about, he was driven, right? So in this book, which earlier I was also trying to figure out, did he give me this or did somebody else? And he confirmed he did. But in this book, and if it's still available, I do recommend it for people that are interested in Manuel's work, um, you can get a real sense of the range of how his work uh, you know, how his ideas, how, how they come together. His painterly, he goes through these different painterly transitions. And for me as a viewer, for me as an artist, I got, I was so taken. And that even three years ago when he made this comment that, you know, other people, you know, now he wasn't alone, like with whatever, that I could relate to that too. So it's, again, it's like this continuum. I'm just trying to go back around to, this concept that we've been talking about earlier with translations, continuums, you know, this sort of thing, and how does art movements, I wish Justin was still here, um, relate to each other, right? Where did he go? I, I, th I think he needs to get his batteries <laughs> recharged. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> no, like like any other place. Yeah. So you're really referring to that? Can you anything more specific? Yeah, specific. The third day. Yeah. Yeah. I th I think in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. You you can't help but uh, but think about that. Yeah. No.
Angelica. Share with the audience a little bit about your collectives that you've formed over the years. Collectives? Yeah, the bastards of misrepresentation. I, um, I, uh, I mean, because because when I, you know, when I show abroad, they're they're very curious about what's happening in the Philippines, um, and uh, it's sort of like uh, a response to that. Okay, you you don't know what's happening in the Philippines. Okay, here. I'm going to do something in Europe that's about uh, contemporary Filipino art and um, sort of the, 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 the criteria for, for showing these artists is that they're, um, that they're active in the art scene, that, that they, um, 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 they're in dialogue with their own medium and that they're not auction divas. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's why I, I did the Bastards of Misrepresentation. And uh, right, right now I'm, um, I created a, a cultural association in Madrid where um, I'm involved with uh, the literary scene there, with the music scene, uh, with the, uh, the 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 artistic uh, underground, um, and uh, it's sort of like a, 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 a sort of like a, an association that has a multiple multiple uh, use association. It has a, it has a space. It has a pre it's connected to a print shop. It uh, creates pop-up exhibitions, uh, readings, uh, uh, sort of uh, mu music events, and it's always sort of like uh, hovering around the borders, because this, the space I have in Madrid is it's an art space, but it's in a car. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 involved with several. It's funny because I'm the only Filipino in this in this association, <laughs> and sort of sort it's sort of something like uh, uh, re reverse colonization. <laughs> but I I don't know. I'm I, uh, uh, Angel is uh, um, is organizing a show about appropriate appropriation, and I'm I'm thinking of like using this. As part of my my contribution to the show, what's this? this talk? The, the no no the <laughs> the the cultural so the Diaz Dedos yeah, cultural association. Okay. I don't know. What's that? Asociación Cultural Diaz Dedos. Yeah, ten fingers. <laughs> yeah. And then, the, and then the, the the space I have is called Cuatro Ruedas, four wheels. <laughs> this space. <laughs> yeah, I, I I like the guerrilla tactic of having a car, and uh, during opening nights in uh, the gallery weekends in in Madrid, I would just park my car somewhere. Uh, close to a gallery and like do my thing there. Do it. <laughs> no, it's a happening. So it's sort of it's like a, a yeah. Uh, wasn't here early part of the talk, I'm sorry. But you didn't miss anything. I'm just wondering, you said you're based in Madrid? Uh, no, I, I'm, um, yeah, yeah. I, I come back and forth. Uh, yeah, so Madrid. How, how, do you, how do you negotiate your practice? Or more uh, as an artist, and uh, a second question would be, uh, what do you plan for next year's Venice? If you're allowed to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> <Jay. laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, how, how, how I negotiate? How I negotiate to to um, being in two places? Uh, being I, I I think. Um, 
I think I think having a lot lots of friends <laughs> with like studios. <laughs> that's how I managed to like uh, be able to like work in Spain or work in here and work. I think it's being connected with people and being uh, uh, being part of a community, a global community, and that's how I, I that's how I'm able to function within like different spaces. And and for ben Venice, um, I think that's it's up to the curator. What what she? Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah. She's the boss. I'm just the artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the theme is called Spectre of Comparison, and what's that? So it's not just you. Been, no, it's with Lani Maestro. It's the, the two of us, and she said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, it is a Benedict, the Spectre of Comparison. It's Benedict, Benedict Anderson, um, but it's taken from Rizal." But it's but. Well, I, th I think what Rizal was saying, it's originally it's called uh, the devil of comparison. It's what he observed when he left Europe and then went back to Manila. Karina, is that correct? Is that correct? No, 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 but when, when Rizal left, when Rizal left Manila, I mean, sorry, left Europe and then Madrid and then went back to Manila. Yeah, there's. That's how his interpretation of how right, he saw Manila. Right. He always sees Manila through, uh, a lens, through, lens. through the lens of like how he lived in Madrid, and like he's, he's seeing like you know like how, like you know you travel a lot, Carlo, and then when you you go to, to the U.S. a lot, and then you come here, and then you see oh this is this is just like L.A. or something. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's that's the that's the, the thing, you know. Yeah. It's through an inverted yeah. lens. Okay. Basically. It's actually or, or in some in some ways if you're in LA, okay, this is kinda like Malate or something. Well it's like a day, yeah. it, it can be it can flip because yeah. it's it's actually also in this day and age, it's globalization and it's it's a certain kind of what it's a perception of a flattening of, of space. Right. Of right. And right. yet, so the question becomes: Is there still originality, or is there still something redeeming in a society or in a culture that is its own? Kind of well, and I don't know if that's where well, well, is going. Right. But those questions come up. Yeah. In, in but 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 in some but now it's sort of like it's flipped. Yeah, it is. Flipped. Like. A lot of there's a lot of Filipino artists going to like Berlin or going to like Europe, and they're influencing artists right. who are German artists or like Spanish artists or like they're the ones influencing them now instead of the other way around. Yeah. How? How are they? By by being there, like 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 for me, I, I was. Like I, I, interactions. Yeah. Maybe being inspired. But I think there's actually this is where that multiculturalism thing comes in because there's a whole history of um, in the eighties when more artists of developing nations or third world countries. So when Jose Bedia, for instance, who's a Cuban artist who like defected from Cuba, from Havana, and um, decided to go to Florida, and then I forget the name of the gallery that he's showing with, but when his works and other Latin American artists, and then someone like Manuel, everybody was coming up simultaneously, Manuel, uh, Basquiat, you know, there are a number of these artists that um, were um, inter it, it, like sort of injecting um, 
the art world at that time with something new, something fresh, something different. And yet, what's kind of, from my point of view, what's insulting to these artists is that they've been doing this. And it's kind of like, oh, the Western art world or whatever, the blue chip art world like kind of went, oh, like this is new. But these artists have been doing these things in their countries for a long time. And so they shared their processes or their practices where they are, which is what I in part think is what you're talking about, um, right? Yeah, I mean, look, look, look at these artists, Andy Hope, 1930. They've, they've, they've said that I've influenced them. Yeah. Jonathan Meese. Uh, so it's 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 that kind of it's the reverse. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. But because that's part of a, I mean, and look at Picasso, Brock, the birth of Cubism, right? You have to go back into art history too to see where the other cultures, the non-Western cultures, were influencing. Yeah, were influencing the West, and I think there's. Um, one can see it more in today's society than back then in what we call the modernist period. I just, I just got curious because when you said that we were influencing by choice as opposed to like African masses being just a passive inspiration from God. So I guess it, I, I like it as a good indicator. We are expanding as a, as oh, yeah. if the culture works. And winning a bit, just a bit. Going back to the exhibit, um, would you say it's a, it's a response to a particularly tragic uh, conditions in our history at the moment? Yes, so that, I think so, yeah. I think that's, 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 that's good. Happening. And that's the reason why I titled it Assassin. Um, yes, and the, um, yes I, I, I think I've, you know, um, reacting to the, the present uh, historical, uh, present conditions right now. Politically, and that's why I called it desas los desastres de la democracia. No, <laughs> no. The the war on drugs just started in the 1970s. I think um, it's well. If you can if you can really look at it, the, the war on well, the war on drugs. The the war on drugs was was called the war on drugs in the 1970s with the Nixon administration. That's yeah, but there, there's always been the war on drugs, uh, even the, the opium wars, you know, with, with the, the, the Boxer Rebellion, with all these Western uh, countries uh, colonized um, because there's the opi opium trade wars. That's true. Yeah, and it's always to subjugate you know, people of color in some sense, you know. And now I think it's it's to like subjugate like the the, the, the poor. You know. Um, and it's unprecedented. Huh? It's unprecedented and it's extremely tragic. It's it's very tragic. As long as it's being seen as a, a criminal act and not a health issue, I think. It's 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 it will always be Tragic uh, and violent. Wait, now you're talking about social stuff because we're going to have to wrap up. Um, <laughs> which you can have a conversation. I mean, yeah, yeah, sorry. But it's a conversation you can have on the side. Are there any last questions or comments? Any questions? I have a question to the young people over there. They're, they're all gone. <laughs> Put you on the spot, but I will. What's the experience like for you to now 
listening to the artist. Yeah, you can say it's full of shit. at the space it's um, how I can how I can how how can I deal with the space where the viewer can uh, can experience um, uh, where the viewer can experience this the space as an environment because it's it's sort of like a difficult space to work with because the ceilings are low and uh, you know, the it's it's painted black, and um, in some sense, I, wa I wanted to uh, I wanted the audience to um, feel um, uh, what 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 it's like, you know, being part of of being part of an artwork. Um, so I, I sort of like approached it in a sense formally. And then um, the idea of uh, Goya with uh, Desastres de la Democracia came about, and that's uh, Desastres de la Guerra, actually. And I say, okay, we're not in a time of war. We're in a time of uh, peace and, and democracy. So what is it? Okay, so I put, <laughs> I, 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 I changed Goya's, uh, uh, title from democracy, uh, the disasters of war into the disasters of democracy, and there you have it. It's sort of like this incoherent mess that you see in that space, which is about, you know, democracy, you know, which is sort of like incoherent. Sometimes you don't know what's happening. Uh, it's chaotic and. Yeah, it's reflective of our society right now, I think, you know. <laughs> yeah, did, did you want it to? No, okay. No. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for those remaining. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have a drawing?
like how did you jump start your career as an artist? As an artist, how I started my career without any formal education. Uh, I, I I had uh, one year at UP, Fine UP Fine Arts. I had one year and I had like uh, a semester in Bakersfield, oh. California. <laughs> well, I think really to be an artist, um, I I I don't know, because I'm I'm sort of like. Um, let's. I, 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 how did I, without any formal education, how did I, how did I come to this this point in my career? Um, I, I think, I think I'm I'm lucky, in a sense. Our schools can teach people how to, to network. That's right. You I know? got my degree. That's what Post Studio means. I got my degree in networking. <laughs> <laughs> you can, uh, ha, ha. It, can, it can teach you how to like, um, be, 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 be socially uh, savvy, you know, how to suck up to people, things like, I don't know. <laughs> No, no, it's not true. I'm just, uh, uh, but um, yeah, I, I I didn't go to art school. I'm just very interested in art. That's my passion, and I I I just you know living in LA, I just went to to openings. Uh, I I sort of um, made friends with a lot of people, uh, connected with people, and I think. I mean, art school also affords you that, you know. But uh, but it's for for a, for an, a, uh, an artist or a starting artist. It's really important to go to openings, to know uh, uh, what the issues are. Um, to yeah, you have to read a lot, uh, observe. Uh, uh, how to talk, uh, learn how to talk to people, and I don't know. That's that's just that's just part of it. <laughs> Well, it's it's a it's a school paper.
I think as an artist, you have to challenge the norms. You have to be a little bit crazy. <laughs> and you, uh, as an artist, you, ha oh, you, you have to play sort of like the fool. You know, you, you can't just be correct. You can't, you can't be appropriate all the time. So you, you, you sort of like... Um, you sort of push the limits of what freedom means, and I, I, I think, I think that's the, that's the function of an artist, is to uh, to create problems, not give solutions. Also has done is bring in. Sorry, Manuel, pan. Okay, um, he's brought in foreign artists as well um, to the Philippines um, in in different degrees or or scales of projects um, with the AGC, um, the ano nga yung pangalan ng the AGC Department of the Department of Avant Garde Clichés. Yeah, yeah. I, With uh, curators from Spain. Yeah, from Spain, yeah. So I think that's also an interesting um, track that he has been doing, uh, uh, contribution he's been doing in the local art scene, um, finding Lord. ways for local artists, curators, and foreign artists and curators to engage um, in, in, in Manila. Right, in yeah. Overseas. I think as an artist, my, my, my function, especially for me, you know, ha having traveled around uh, the world, I think it's a, uh, connectivity is important to me, to be interconnected, you know, forming bridges, I think, um, for me it's important. That's why I'm doing a lot of collaborations. Of, um, the dialogue is very important with me, and it's 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 something that makes uh, the culture moving. It doesn't uh, stagnate, and that's that's my fear. Really, is for me to like uh, okay, uh, sit in one place and already not know what I'm doing, you know, and just be be there, like you know, frozen in time. So for me, it's, uh, it's important to keep on moving, to, to, to bring in ideas all the time, and uh, uh, be a bridge to communities, to people. And uh, yeah, and, and for me, that's, that's what makes uh, culture active, you know. Uh, I've, I've sort of retired the best bastards, so I'm I'm really focused on this cultural association in Spain that I'm doing. Get in the car. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I actually, actually, uh, w once it's set up, I'm gonna ask artists to participate in my space, to be part of the the the, the, the qu uh, four wheel, <laughs> cuatro ruedas <laughs> space. It's in Madrid, yeah. It's in Madrid, yeah. Can I be the <laughs> bus driver? Sure. <laughs> Can you drive? <laughs> that's that's why I'm 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 trying to get an international driver's license. I mean, this is my new project right now. So. It's it's actually it's a Renault. <laughs> that's too small. I, there, I don't, there are no Spanish cars. It's they're Seat, Seat, they're Seat, Seat. But it's really shitty. Eh? It's a really shitty. Uh, it's the same here. It's the same here. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm. That's that's my new project now. 
doing this thing in Madrid and trying to get like an exchange between uh, a Spanish artists and Filipino artists. So uh, maybe another bastards could come out of it, but I don't know. So we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I've, I put out something for, uh, at the Met, you know, to to for artists to like come to me and propose something so I could present it uh, to the Met here. The Met to me. Yeah, but so far no one has like responded. Like I was challenging the Met to, to um, let me do something, you know, Can but. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called Brave New Worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2014. Yeah. I, uh, right now, I have a showing room. I have a showing room at the drawing room. <laughs> I was, I was show at the drawing room right now. October four, till October four or eight, yeah, yeah, till Saturday. Yeah, yeah. It's about drugs, actually. You have to be, you have, to, you have to be under the influence to go in. Otherwise, you'll just see like paintings. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I think I, I'm just putting drugs out there <laughs> just to like challenge certain, you know, certain norms. I don't know.